Dear Heavenly Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. This is the day that you have made and we do rejoice, Lord. We're so thankful for the life that you blessed us with. We thank you for being with us this semester as we head into spring break, Lord. Please be with us and bless us with um, rest in every way. Lord, now we commit our minds, our hearts, um, and our bodies to you, Lord, as we uh, listen to um, Professor Hughes bring this amazing talk to us. Lord, I pray that you help us to have open hearts, open minds, and I pray that you help us to uh, think through everything that we are listening to today. Be with our speaker, Lord, and bless him and his family in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, thank you all for being here. Welcome back for the second part of this talk on the ecology of food production systems. So in the last talk, we discussed how important ecology is in understanding how food production systems actually work. We talked about the importance of connectivity and diversity in making systems that function really well and are resilient to change. In particular, we talked about how if you have a diverse array of plants in a system, they pump a diversity of root exudates into the ground, which attracts a diversity of soil microbiota, which refertilizes the soil. We then talked about how modern industrial agriculture doesn't really consider the ecology and instead focuses on growing food efficiently in these large monoculture fields where the plant diversity is one crop at a time in a field. And what that does is it destroys the ecological function of the system and there's a whole host of effects and consequences of doing that. Uh, first of all, it depletes the soil of nutrients, which results in food that's a lot less nutritious um, than food that's grown in diverse systems. Secondly, it requires the input externally of agricultural fertilizers that around 80% can run off into waterways, which causes eutrophication in waterways, which depletes the oxygen from those waters and causes massive die-off of fish and other aquatic and so um, every year in the summer, uh, the agricultural runoff from the Mississippi River watershed flows into the Gulf of Mexico and creates a massive dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So it affects not only the nutritional quality of the food that we're growing, but it also affects our access to food such as freshwater fisheries and seafood stocks in the ocean as well. And uh, in addition to that, uh, usually herbicides are applied in these monoculture fields to control weeds um, and then because there's a lack of diversity in plants there's a lack in diversity of natural pest control in the form of wasps and other uh, predatory insects and so pesticides have to be added to those fields as well and so pesticides and herbicides can then additionally impact <coughs> and all of this can be kind of tied back to this philosophy of modern industrial agriculture that focuses on monoculture. So what we'll do today is we'll look at some possible solutions for how to move forward. And it seems at first that the answer kind of presents itself, right? Because if you're growing food in systems that are not diverse and it has all of these consequences, then the natural solution is to grow food in systems that are more diverse, right? So. Today's talk will be kind of answering the question, does that actually work? So I want to start by considering a system that is a natural system. Let's say it's a forest. Uh, here in, in Florida, that could be something like an oak forest. There could be oaks and uh, pecan trees, hickory, walnut. Uh, the understory could have persimmons or guavas or whatever. In a natural system like that, is there a need for humans to input agricultural fertilizer? No, not at all. Why is that? How does the system fertilize itself? So it's, it's the same process that I've mentioned before. Diversity of plants pumps diversity of root exudates into the ground, which attracts diversity of soil microbiota, which chelates diversity of nutrients and applies them to the root zone of the plants in a form that's available for them to actually use. So um, in a system like this, it's not only important for that process to occur, but a crucial component of making sure that fertility continues over time is nutrient cycling. So over the last couple weeks, this is what my front yard looks like. This isn't actually my front yard, but it looks just like this. Um, so we have a live oak tree in our front yard and it's shedding all of its winter leaves and putting on new leaves for spring. So 
what do most people do when their yard looks like this? Break it up. Yeah, break it up, put it in bags, take it down to the curb, throw it away. Um, the problem with that is that all of these leaves are full of nutrients. So by removing those nutrients from the system, we are systematically removing fertility from our soil. Um, now, most American lawns are monocultures of grass. That's a whole other topic I'm not going to get into today. But the point is that uh, leaves will break down and fertilize the soil. So leaves are a form of mulch. And mulch is really critically important in a lot of ecological systems, and I would argue in agricultural systems as well. So first of all, mulch shades the surface of the soil, which helps prevent um, the, the soil surface from getting too hot. If it gets too hot, then the soil microbiota in the first few inches of soil will die. Uh, there's uh, one phrase I've heard before for gardening, it's never bare soil, and that's because if you have bare soil, then the sun just bakes it and evaporates a lot of the water off of it and can kill some of the microbiota in the top layers of soil. So if you have a covering of mulch, which could be something like leaf litter, it could be, um, it could be wood chips, it could be pine straw, you know, there's a whole bunch of different types of mulch. Mulch could also be green mulch, which is living plants like ground covers that provide basically the same function. Another uh, important function is that it reduces evaporation. This is especially true of the green mulches. It improves water retention by acting like a sponge and absorbing water. So I can demonstrate this really simply. If you have, if you picture like a 45 degree slope that is paved with concrete or asphalt, and you dump a five gallon bucket of water on it, what's gonna to happen to that water? It's gonna go right down the asphalt, right? Now imagine a slope in a forest that's also 45 degrees, but instead of asphalt, it's dirt, and it's covered with a thick layer of spongy um, mulch. What happens if you dump a five gallon bucket of water on that slope? Does the five gallon break down? Yeah, it'll, the, the mulch will absorb some of that water as it goes down, so it slows the flow rate and absorbs a lot of that water. So mulch really does a good job of holding on to water. It also provides really good habitat for microfauna. These are things like earthworms and isopods and springtails, which help to break down the leaves or mulch or whatever it is into soil and that's the last uh, benefit of the mulch is it does break down the soil over time. A more appropriate statement would be it actually breaks down into compost because it's more rich in, uh, in fertilizer. So why am I starting off talking about mulch? Um, I'll get to that in just a second but before I do I want to take a detour and talk about ecological succession uh, because it is really crucially important to the talk that we're doing today. So one form of mulch that um, is kind of inspired by ecological succession is called chop and drop. That's the idea where you grow fast growing um, species solely for the purpose of cutting them down, chopping them down, and dropping them around your other plants to feed them as a form of mulch. And that comes from ecological succession. So ecological succession is the process by which a disturbed site um, recovers into a mature site. And that might be a little vague, so I'll walk through an example with you guys. So let's imagine a plot of forest, say an oak forest, gets cleared for housing development. So what they do, they come in, they clear all the trees and all the vegetation, they break up the ground, and you're left with just a big plot of bare soil. Now let's say the housing development falls through for whatever reason, and that plot of land is left for, I don't know, 50 years. What happens is the first plants that will come in and recolonize that habitat are called early successional species. Those are things that we would often consider as weeds. So their seeds are brought in by birds or blown in from the wind or by uh, water flow, things like that. And early successional plants are those that thrive on disturbance. They do really well in these disturbed habitats that have poor soil. Not only are weeds early successional species, but there are also some trees as well that act as early successional species. And usually they all have kind of similar traits. Usually they're nitrogen fixers, so they're legumes. Legumes you can tell um, right away because they have a seed pod that's flat usually. Um, some other plants have seed pods that aren't flat, but the classic flat seed pods are a sign of a nitrogen fixing tree. And because 
they have this relationship with soil bacteria that allows them to use nitrogen from the air and convert it into a form of nitrogen that the plant can use, um, they can grow in these disturbed habitats. Usually they grow really quickly as well. So at the beginning stages of ecological succession, we get these weeds and these um, pioneer trees or, or support species that come in and they start to establish a system. They start pumping root exudates into the ground. They start um, providing a little bit of shade to the soil. And a lot of these pioneer plants are either seasonal or um, they're, uh, they'll lose their leaves in the winter, they're deciduous. So those leaves will fall down and start to build up mulch. And eventually over time, the system will develop to the point where mid-successional species can come in. These are things like shrubs and some of the more hardy uh, forest trees and things like that. Eventually, as the diversity continues to increase and the soil fertility continues to increase, you end up with the late successional species that don't do well at all in the disturbed habitat. But once the habitat starts to get prepared, they can come in and start to grow. And among these late successional species are what we call climax species. These are the most dominant species in a mature system. So in this example, an oak tree, which is really slow growing and is usually a late successional species, once those oak trees grow to a certain size and the system becomes mature, eventually that system will reach the climax community, which is dominated by oaks, which is right back where we started. So ecological succession is this beautifully designed system whereby sites are disturbed and then they recover and go back to a mature system through the work of pioneer plants as it goes through these different stages of succession. Does that make sense? So I would argue that if we're going to want to move from systems that are low in diversity to systems that are high in plant diversity, we should probably mimic ecological succession because it works so well. So, um, at this point, I'm going to go into um, I'm going to go into why I started talking about mulch in the first place. And I know it seems like kind of a boring way to start a talk about mulch. Actually, side note: one of the most interesting lectures I've ever attended was about mulch. Um, <laughs> and it sounds funny to say that, but it was it was a phenomenal uh, phenomenal lecture. I saw one time. Uh, mulch is part of the way that these systems can re-fertilize themselves. They're not reliant on external inputs. The reason I'm talking about mulch is because over the last month or so, I've read several news articles, and you guys may have seen them too, that all were from different sources but say the same thing. There's a major concern right now that Western food production systems could be on the brink of collapse if Russia decides to cut off its supply of industrial agricultural fertilizer. So if that's the case, if they do decide to cut off those fertilizers, a lot of these monoculture systems will collapse because they're so dependent on these external inputs. Notice the contrast between these monoculture systems that are dependent on these external inputs and natural systems that are not, that can take care of themselves and fertilize themselves. So, I would make the argument that monocultures are the infants of agricultural production systems. They can't take care of themselves. You have to constantly feed and water them. They're messy, they're picky, you have to give them the right balance of fertilizers. They're not resilient, they don't like change. Instead of growing food that way, why don't we grow food in systems that can, we can guide them through the process of maturity so that they can reach a point where they can take care of themselves without us. So does that actually work? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna walk you through kind of a quick tour of some case studies uh, throughout time and in various locations across the world where uh, the indigenous peoples grew food in systems that were diverse and it really worked. You might think it's kind of odd that I'm going back to a time before our modern understanding of how soil ecology works and using that as an example of how our modern understanding of soil ecology works. But I'd like to make uh, the claim that 
these ecological processes are going on whether or not we understand them. And so a lot of the people that are growing these systems that I'll talk about historically, they might not have known about microbiology or chelation of nutrients in the soil, but they were observant and they could see that natural systems, which are naturally diverse, are really good at growing plants. And so I think uh, even if they didn't necessarily know the terminology for it or how it worked, they knew that it worked and they practiced it. So I'll start by going to the Fertile Crescent. So historically, over the last hundred years or so, historians have kind of had this idea because of the way that we grow food in monocultures, that cultures throughout history have grown their crops in monocultures because that's how we do it. They assume that they did it as well. Recent research is kind of turning that on its head through uh, these massland agricultural systems. This is where you grow a variety of grain crops in the same field at the same time. So this could be wheat and sorghum and millet and rye and barley and all, all of these different ones that you grow in the same field at the same time. So just a really simple example of how this works. Wheat thrives in wet years generally, barley thrives in dry years. So if you have a field that's all wheat and you have a dry year, you get a poor harvest. And same thing with barley in a wet year. If you grow them both in the same field and you get a wet year, then your harvest might be 75% wheat and 25% barley. The next year, if you have a dry year, you might have 25% wheat and 75% barley. And that's just by increasing the diversity to two. By growing these masslands of a mixture of different grains, it allowed them to have a little bit more food, food security um, that just varied depending on the environmental conditions that that year uh, presented. So really over the last five years is when they've started noticing that these systems were used throughout the Fertile Crescent. And uh, the research over the last five years has so far found that these were used also throughout Europe um, in the earliest agricultural records um, in Europe and in the Fertile Crescent. So far they've been uh, documented in at least 27 different countries. And now the researchers are starting to claim that this was the standard practice for growing food, um, growing grain crops anyway, at that time. So we'll go across the Atlantic now, and we'll go to Mexico, and I wanna start in the Oaxaca Valley. So this is an area that has some of the earliest um, records of agriculture, and the Oaxaca Valley is significant because of the systems that they grew. So, this is where it is geographically. The ancient farmers of Oaxaca grew what is now called a milpa, which is a field in which there were generally at least 12 different kinds of crops growing in the same field at the same time. And when they cleared their fields to plant a milpa, they usually left their nitrogen fixing trees as well. I wanna point out that milpas have a lot of different variations throughout history. Um, the Aztecs did it a little bit differently than the Maya, who did it a little differently than the people in Oaxaca. Some of those systems went through a rotational cycle where they would start with a milpa and eventually convert it into a food forest. And then like in an eight to 10 year cycle, they would grow the food forest, then they cut down all the trees, use the lumber, start with the milpa again, and kind of cycle through that way. Um, but some of the crops that they grew there include some very familiar crops to us. I want to start with corn because corn is a really interesting story. I don't know if you guys know this, but corn does not exist in the wild. It is not a wild plant. Corn, a lot of people uh, consider to be the first genetically modified organism. Does anyone have any idea where corn comes from? If it's not a wild plant. So corn was actually developed in the Oaxaca Valley uh, from a wild grass called teosinte, which has a little tiny grain head that kind of looks, if you guys can see on the top left there, kind of looks like the grain head on the top there. And they selected and bred the corn, or the teosinte varieties that had the largest grain heads. And then the next generation, they did the same thing. And the next generation, they did the same thing. 
And this was a process that may have taken several hundreds of years to finish. So it was a long-term genetically uh, modifying breeding experiment, basically, that eventually developed into corn. They also, along with the corn, grew beans, uh, which aren't shown there, squash, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, avocados. Does anyone know what this fruit is there? Cacao, yeah, that's cacao. Uh, that's where we get chocolate from. So, uh, fun fact about chocolate, chocolate is actually a modification of the Aztec word chocolate, which came from a drink that they made using fermented cacao mixed with Mexican tarragon, which is a type of marigold. So since we're talking about an Aztec word, I'll switch over to, um, to the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan, which is modern day Mexico City. So Mexico City was built on a floodplain lake uh, on the, the ruins of the Aztec capital. And the Aztecs grew what are called chinampas. Chinampas are still grown today in limited quantities in Mexico City. Um, but it was basically a milpa that was grown on a man-made island in the lake. So I'll explain how that works in just a second. But these milpas um, allowed them to incorporate harvesting of fish with their production of crops because there were islands and canals between them. And so they could go out and harvest fish and crops at the same time. And the few chinampas that are around today are some of the last surviving strongholds for the axolotl, which is also an Aztec word, by the way. Um, the axolotl, for those of you that don't know, it's an amphibian. Amphibians are generally really sensitive to poor water quality. So the presence of axolotls in these chinampa systems really speaks to the water quality in those systems as well. So this is kind of what that looked like. What they would do first is they would drive these uh, wooden poles into the mud at the bottom of the lake, and they would weave uh, reeds between them to make a wall or a box. At the corners, the corner posts would be made from willow trees that would grow. The willow trees would provide a little bit of additional shade to the crops in the heat of the summer, and then seasonally would lose their leaves, which would form a mulch on top of those systems, which would also be beneficial to the system. They would fill up those boxes with uh, decaying logs and things like that, and then a, a lot of sediment from the lake bottom, which was also very fertile, until they got those boxes above the level of the water, and then they basically grew a milpa-like system of food on top of it. So the milpa was also, in a modified form, spread throughout North America through what's called Three Sisters agriculture, which is corn, beans, and squash. So this was a practice that was really widespread in Native American tribes from the deserts of Arizona in the southwest up to the northeast, all the way down here to Florida, corn, beans, and squash were kind of a standard practice. And the way that works is the squash uh, has these broad leaves that shade the seedling corn and keep it from wilting in the sun. The corn grows up and provides a trellis for the beans. The beans in turn are nitrogen fixers, which feed nitrogen to the roots of the corn. Corn is a really heavy nitrogen feeder. And then the squash would spread out and cover the ground, acting as a living mulch while also providing a food source as well. And this was a really effective system, and you can tell how effective it is by the fact that it was grown everywhere from the desert to areas with cold climates to the hot, humid Florida summers as well. On top of it, these three crops eaten together are nutritionally complemented as well. <coughs> So we'll go back across the Atlantic now to Morocco. And I know this is kind of a blurry Google image, but I want to point out, for those of you that don't know, Morocco is mostly desert. It is very dry. Right here, you can see this ribbon of green. That is an agricultural system, and that's one that I'll be talking about. So in the 70s, there were two Australian ecologists who were in Morocco for a surfing trip and they heard from the locals about this place that was a, they described like almost like a humid, almost rainforest type place. And they were a little bit baffled by that. So they went and they found it. And what they found, according to the locals, was a food forest that had been grown for roughly 2000 years. So this food forest existed 
possibly at the time of Christ, to give you an idea of how old this system is. So this food forest had a date palm canopy. Underneath the canopy were understory trees, um, various varieties of olives, as well as citrus. You can see all of those in this picture here. And then beneath the canopy, they would grow various forms of annual vegetables, corn and beans, and other crops like that. And again, this is growing in a really, really dry and arid location. And when they first walked into it, they described how going from the hot desert sun into this food forest, it was cool, it was moist, it was shaded, um, and it was like a, a completely different environment. So this experience kind of inspired uh, these two Australians, Bill Mollison and Jeff Lawton, to uh, describe what we now know today as permaculture. Permaculture is the concept of instead of growing food in temporary season by season intensive agriculture systems, that we grow food permanently, permanent agriculture, permaculture. So permaculture is this concept that instead of growing food just temporarily, we grow food in systems that will last for our children and their children, and it kind of goes on for uh, as long as as long as it will, depending on the species that you grow. And permaculture um, is a really kind of popular buzzword in agriculture today uh, for those that are kind of trying to get away from monoculture. One thing I do want to clarify though is that Bill Mollison and, and uh, Jeff Lawton didn't invent permaculture, they just described it. Permaculture has been practiced all across the world for thousands of years before them. Um, so a lot of indigenous cultures know already how to do permaculture, it's just it wasn't really described in the literature until, um, until they discovered it. So now we'll go to the Amazon Basin. And the Amazon Basin for a long time was thought to be this pristine, untouched primary rainforest, and that's really not the case. The earliest uh, reports of the Spanish and Portuguese explorers described a massive population living in the Amazon Basin at the time of first contact. And recent research does support that theory. So this comes from two methods. One, we can study the composition of the trees in the forest, and we can see where certain areas of forest are largely dominated by fruit trees and other trees that are beneficial to people in much higher proportions than occur naturally. And that's a good indicator that they were cultivated as a food forest. But also, um, the Amazon basin is known for having what's called terra preta, which is Amazon dark herbs. So these are these um, anthropogenic soils that are largely based on biochar, uh, which is uh, charcoal-based soil. And these are indicative of human habitation because they're mixed in not only charcoal, but they're mixed in with pottery and they're mixed in with fish bones and that sort of thing. And so it's a good indication of previous human habitation. Normally in the rainforest, soils are terrible. I know it seems counterintuitive, but with the constant heavy rainfall, a lot of nutrients leach out of the soil very quickly in the tropics. And so most of the fertility is actually above the ground in the trees that are growing um, because it just leaches out of the soil really quickly. So what they did was they would, I know it's kind of a huge like no-no nowadays, but they would practice slash and burn agriculture where they would chop down a section of forest and burn it. And that burning of that vegetation at low temperatures would produce what's called biochar, which is a form of charcoal. Biochar is uh, extremely good at capturing nutrients and preventing them from leaching from the soil. So all the nutrients that were contained in that vegetation that they chopped down would then be bound to the charcoal and wouldn't run off. And the charcoal doesn't hold it so tightly that the plants that are grown afterwards can't access it. So it provides this really, really, really fertile soil that even after 500 plus years of tropical rainfall, the soil still looks like this because of how good charcoal is at holding those nutrients. And so through a combination of looking at Amazon dark herbs and 
also the proportions of the fruit trees that were grown. Most estimates now place the amount of cultivated food forest orchards in the Amazon Basin historically at about 12% of the Amazon Basin's surface area. To give you an idea, that's 337,000 square miles of cultivated food forest. If you can't put that into your brain, has anyone ever driven across the state of Texas? Nobody? It takes forever. It really does. You can wake up in Texas, drive eight or nine hours, and go to sleep still in Texas. Uh, like it, it is a really wide state to traverse. If you took the square footage, the land area of Texas, and you added to it the land area of Florida, that's how much food forest was historically grown in the Amazon basin. So I've been talking a lot about these historical cases, but does it work in the present? So I want to introduce you to a permaculture practitioner named Angelo Eliades. Uh, he lives in Melbourne in Australia, and he took this idea of a food forest and thought, let's see if we can actually make it work in practice. So what he did was in his backyard, which was about 600 square feet, so two one hundredths of an acre, tiny little suburban backyard in Australia, he planted over 70 different kinds of fruits and a whole bunch of different vegetables in a really dense system, and he weighed the yields that he got from his backyard from the beginning all the way to, at this point, was at year four. The first year in his tiny backyard, he harvested almost 300 pounds of food. By year four, he harvested over 500 pounds of food. If you scale this productivity up to the size of an acre, that's over 32,000 pounds of food in one acre. So to put this into perspective, Australia's best and most productive wheat fields only reach about one eighth of that productivity um, over the span of the year per acre. And Australia is not necessarily known for growing wheat. So if we go to the breadbasket of Europe, where some of the most productive wheat fields on the planet are, it still only reaches about half of the productivity of this guy's backyard in Australia growing food. It took him by himself without help less than three months to plant his food forest. And when they asked him how long he spends maintaining it, he said uh, less than two hours a week. So that's what his, what his backyard looks like. Um, you can see how small it is. And he was able to get that amount of productivity to grow it. So my point with this is there's kind of this common misconception that growing food sustainably is less productive than growing food through a monoculture system. And that may be the case, depending on how the food is grown. In both cases, there are a lot of variables. But this shows that it doesn't have to be the case. If it's done the right way, um, growing food sustainably can produce and can outproduce monoculture. So how do we apply these concepts to changing the way that we grow food? So first, I want to point out that the most plausible way to implement these changes probably is on the individual backyard or family scale, not necessarily on the scale of these massive mega farms. Now, it has been done on some of these mega farms, but it requires a lot of work because the soil is so damaged, it requires a lot of time to go through ecological succession. And probably the biggest hurdle is it really requires a philosophical change outside of the the monoculture kind of mindset. So I would recommend for each of you, and I know we're all at different phases and different places in our life, so it may not apply to all of you yet, but at some point I would encourage all of you to grow your own food, especially here in Florida. It is really a lot easier than you would think. And I'll go walk through some uh, different methods of growing food sustainably that might be encouraging just to give you guys an idea of what you might research on your own if you're interested. But the point isn't which particular method you choose. The point is just grow for, for plant diversity and we all have different preferences on how, how we go about that. I already mentioned permaculture. If you're interested, I do recommend looking up YouTube videos of Jeff Lawton and Henry Wilson. Um, they're, they're both really good at what they do. 
Agroecology is basically what we're talking about this whole time. It's the concept of reconnecting a knowledge of ecology to how we grow food. Another popular one right now is no-till agriculture. This has actually been adopted in Argentina, even in their, uh, even in their major farms. It's the concept that if you till up and dig up the soil, which is standard practice in monocultures, you destroy the soil life that's in that spot. So no-till, instead of digging up and tilling up the soil, you apply all of your amendments on top, compost, mulch, things like that. Hugh Richards has a great YouTube channel kind of talks about those sorts of things. Lasagna gardening is also important, or, uh, also popular right now. It's also one that's kind of mispracticed a lot. So lasagna gardening is basically composting in place. We have layers of material that are breaking down. And they usually recommend doing layers of cardboard. Don't do that. Cardboard becomes hydrophobic over time uh, in the soil and will actually prevent water from getting to it. That was one of the things I learned from that phenomenal mulch lecture. <laughs> Um, square foot gardening is also popular, so that's for those of you that are more mathematically minded and organized. It's marking off literally just square feet in your garden and growing one crop in each square foot. Um, my wife really likes this concept. It is way too organized for my taste. I like to just go throw seeds everywhere. <laughs> that's, that's my <laughs> preference. Um, Agroforestry is also uh, kind of in vogue right now, it's this idea that um, you can grow agricultural systems and forestry systems at the same time, specifically trees that are useful for lumber. And these can also be combined with things like silvopasture where you're um, running grazing animals like cattle or goats, or in some cases, geese through an agroforestry system. Another one is syntropic agriculture. This one kind of drives me crazy because it has so many rules, like you have to do this and this timing and plant this at this time. Uh, the best thing that I, I pulled from it is the idea of growing even your trees really densely, to, like closely spaced together. And then uh, probably my personal favorite is the food forest concept because it's been done so many times throughout the world in different climates and it just works really well. Um, David the Good has a great book about growing a Florida food forest. He also has a great YouTube channel. He's a little bit eccentric, but he's also a very brilliant person as well. Um, and then deep green permaculture is the Australian that I mentioned who grew that really productive food forest. And there's another YouTube channel called uh, Native Permaculture Legacy. Has some, some good uh, info on it as well. So I wanna talk a little bit more about a food forest. Um, a food forest kind of mimics the pro process of ecological succession that we talked about earlier. You start with your pioneer plants and then you basically develop a forest um, structure where each layer of the forest structure has a use for food. So oftentimes, you know, your, your canopy trees could be things like walnut or pecans or avocados or something like that. And I'll walk through more details on this in just a minute, but the idea is that at every layer of this forest, you can get something useful from it food-wise. And they don't necessarily have to look spread out like that. This is an example of one that was more densely planted. And I'll walk through some recommendations. I know this might not apply for all of you right now, but you're welcome to take pictures of these if you're interested. I'll walk through each of those different layers and give just a few like basic introductory level recommendations for plants specifically for Florida. So pioneer plants here in Florida uh, jacarandas are fantastic. Um, they're in the top right there. They just started blooming uh, just now. I saw the first one yesterday. And then royal poinsettias, you guys have probably seen these around in Florida. They bloom during the summer. Both of those are nitrogen fixers, so they'll improve the soil and they're a great pioneer. <coughs> and they look fantastic as well. Um, powder puff trees on the genus Caligandra are also great, as well as some of the Senna species. Um, this is Inga edulis. This is the ice cream bean from South America. I actually got to try this when I was in Brazil. Um, basically, there are these little seeds in the seed pod that are surrounded by what looks and feels and tastes like cotton candy. Um, so those are pretty incredible. And they're fantastic nitrogen fixers as well. Mulberries are also great early successional species. They don't fix nitrogen, but they grow 
really fast. At least the red and white mulberries. No, the black mulberries taste better, but they grow more slowly. Oh. So canopy trees for Florida. Avocados are fantastic. Um, trumpet trees are also great. There are a whole bunch of different species here. You guys have probably seen them blooming recently. Um, hickory, live oak, pine. Again, this is just a really basic walk through. Understory trees is where it gets really fun. This is where all, all the good, tasty stuff is. If you're growing food in Florida, grow a moringa tree, at least one moringa tree, um, because they're fantastic. One of the most nutritious foods on the planet. Um, they're, they're really great for a lot of reasons. Bananas, loquats, mangoes are a personal favorite, star fruit. Um, Jabota kava is a really cool fruit. So the flowers actually flower on the trunk of the tree, not on the branches. And then the fruits, which are, uh, they call it tree grape. Uh, they kind of taste like grapes, will actually develop on the trunk of the tree. So it's like the, tr the tree trunk is clustered with, with grapes. It's kind of interesting. Um, for citrus, that's one that is unfortunately one that I recommend with reservation in Florida. Citrus has been grown in monocultures in Florida for so long that it is now, uh, has a ton of pest and disease problems, unfortunately. So 100 years ago, a citrus tree would live 20 to 30 years and still produce. Be lucky to get one to live past five years today in Florida because of the, the effects of monoculture. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of others that, this is just barely scratching the surface. We live in the subtropics, so there are literally thousands of species of subtropical fruits from around the world that grow really well in this climate. For shrubs, blueberries, blackberries, they're great. Okra, Florida cranberry is fantastic. Um, Barbados cherry tastes really good, and each individual cherry has more than a daily serving of vitamin C in it. Um, those grow really well here. Gumi berries or nitrogen fixtures, and they're great as well. For the flower layer, uh, marigolds, once you plant them, you'll not be able to get rid of them. They grow really, really well. Um, Firebush is also great. For root crops, sweet potatoes, you can't go wrong with in Florida. You can, as I mentioned last time, you can put a mushy sweet potato in the sand and it will grow sweet potatoes. Um, you know, turmeric and ginger grow really well out here. Jerusalem artichoke is a really cool plant. It's a species of sunflower that grows an edible uh, tuberous root. It kind of tastes like if you picture potatoes mixed with sunflower seeds, that's kind of what it tastes like. And it's also uh, barely has any carbs at all. Ground cover is up here. Uh, perennial peanut is up here because we actually have some growing on campus out uh, in that direction. You guys have probably seen it before. Um, those flowers are actually edible. I don't know if I would eat the ones here, so I don't know how they treat with the insecticides or anything, but those are edible flowers. And then the vine layer, a lot of great vines in Florida. Um, this I took on Tuesday, got my first uh, Brazilian passion flower to open. Um, so that's a photo from my backyard. Muscadine grapes do great. Seminole pumpkins are another plant you can plant and forget about, and they'll just continue to grow and grow and grow. Dragon fruit also does really well up here. You can also grow annuals in the Florida food forest as well. Um, I mentioned Seminole pumpkin earlier. Um, it's technically an annual, but depending on the season, it can last longer than that. Um, it's my husky in the background. Um, Everglades tomato is a native uh, tomato that does really well. Black eyed peas are probably the easiest thing, in my opinion, to grow in Florida. You can just get a bag of them for 60 cents, throw them out in the sand right before rainy season, and they'll produce copious quantities of peas. Um, sweet peppers, tomatillos, and I listed just a few of my favorite heat tolerant tomatoes for Florida. Uh, Cherokee purples are phenomenal. If you've never eaten one, it tastes nothing like any other tomato you've tasted. Um, so just wanted to walk through and inspire you guys. <coughs> this is just, a, just scratching the surface of the kind of foods that you can grow in Florida in a food forest system like this that focuses on diversity. And if we set it up the right way, a system like this could endure for generations to come and requires no external inputs of fertilizers. It doesn't require pesticides or herbicides, um, produces better quality, nutritious food, and food that frankly just tastes better. 
which is one of the reasons that I like growing food, because I like to eat. So, um, again, that's kind of the structure of a food forest. And I would encourage each of you to grow your own food. It's a lot easier than you would think it is, especially here in Florida. Florida wants to be a forest naturally anyway. Um, so that, I'll, I'll leave off there and see if you guys have any questions. way to do it. I mean, uh, you can you can you can run them over with a lawnmower, and they'll break down. And like by spring, you won't be able to get it right away. So. Yeah. So, like on average, how much money do you save growing your own food? Like usually, do you um, think it's more expensive or less? I would I would think it's a lot less expensive, and it varies depending on how you grow it. So like if you go out and you buy a bunch of plants at Home Depot or Lowe's, it'll be more expensive. Mm -hmm. But if you buy seeds or if you just like there's a, there's a tree growing on the street and you grab a seed pot off of it and start planting it, like it's a lot, it's a lot cheaper. Um, I find myself going to the grocery store a lot less, um, which also saves gas, which is great as well. <laughs> so it depends on how you grow. You could, you could buy all the expensive trees and stuff, but or you could just save seeds. Yeah. What's your favorite thing that you've ever grown? Favorite thing that I've ever grown? That's a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, the easiest thing I've ever grown is collard greens. Um, you put them in the ground, I don't water them. They survive through the heat of the summer and full sun. They survive through the winter, like with frost and everything. <laughs> and they're still there and they're still producing. Like literally the easiest thing you could possibly grow in Florida in my opinion. But my favorite is Daro's blueberry, probably of the ones I've grown so far. It's a native Florida blueberry. They're like this big. They're super, super tiny blueberries, but they are fantastic. Like they're packed with so much flavor. Do you guys know where the nectary is? If you've driven by it, kind of over by Family Worship Center off of, I think it's Main Street. It's a local Florida native plant nursery. And that's where I got my Daro's blueberry. They have a lot of other stuff there, you know, fire bush and stuff. Yeah. Okay, so I have a plant in my window and it's very angry at me currently. Um, and it, is it, so like it, it gets like full sun kind of in the day. And what you said about like if it's too much sun and the first two layers die, how do I, how would I fix that? Um, so the question was about the plant. Uh, what, <laughs> what kind of plant is it? got long, narrow, pointed leaves. Does it have a braided trunk? Uh, no, it's like, it's... <laughs> <laughs> you threw me off the Chinese part. I know the money tree. Um, I don't know. I, I which is long. And it, I scanned it, and that's the name it gave it, so... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so if you maybe find that's the problem. If you find it, you can read up the name. That's what it is. Sorry. How <laughs> good it looks like. Oh, yeah, that's um, Pilea peperomioides, which is a name. <laughs> so I don't know what the common name is for it. Dollar, dollar plant or something, maybe money plant. Um, they love moisture. Like, they really, really like moisture. Um, I have one growing in a terrarium that has like 99% humidity <laughs> all the time. And, uh, and it loves it in there. They, they dry out really easily. Um, easiest way to do that would be to get some leaf litter, crumble it up, and put it on the surface of the soil, and then water it really thoroughly, and that leaf litter will help keep the soil from evaporating. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. So yeah. how do you irrigate your, your like, backyard, I guess? Do you, did you do it yourself, or did you just get like a hose? It, it varies. So I have 
my plants growing in all different situations. I have a, like an in-ground garden pen that's kind of keeping them protected from my dogs who will always <laughs> trample them. Um, <laughs> that I have a layer of leaf litter and I pretty much never water it. Um, it just gets watered in the rain. Um, all my container plants I have to water more frequently just with a hose or watering can. Um, if you want a more uh, in-depth answer you can design a food forest by doing <coughs> what are called swales which are uh, basically earthworks that are all along the same plane and what happens is when the rain comes it will fill up the swale and the swale will soak into a layer of mulch on the other side which is where your food forest is planted and it basically will hold and retain that water so that it gets water during the rainy season and then retains that moisture through the dry season. Um, I had a dove sweat with it when I was younger. So. And when you're first when you're first starting out, it'll need more water, but as the system matures, it'll, it'll need less and less water because the plants get used to the setting, but then also the mulch and the leaf litter and everything, the soil gets a lot more healthy and can hold on to that water better over time. Joe. Sorry. Yeah, you're good. Oh, you're kind of answering it, but um, like my backyard's two bushes and a tree. Mm -hmm. You know, like so I have an orange tree and a lemon tree, mm -hmm. and like they thrive in the sun. But like what, like if you wanted to start something big, would you have to like do something? Would you want to like put it back in? Yeah. So um, that's a good question, and your research <laughs> suggests that especially in disturbed sites, which like sandy soil is a disturbed site. Um, if you mulch it heavily, that really speeds up ecological succession. Um, not all plants can tolerate mulch. If you do mulch, you don't want to mulch up to the trunk because it can like cause mold to grow and stuff. So like leave a gap around it a little bit. But um, yeah, mulch is a good way to start. So uh, mulch is also free in most cases. You can just call a utility company, the ones that go around and chop down the trees from power lines and say, hey, do you have any mulch that you need to get rid of? And they'll just come and dump a truckload of it in your, in your yard and <laughs> spread it out. So mulch is another free resource, yeah. So, the, um, yeah, well, so have you been running kind of the food forest system in your own yard, or has it, like, and if so, how long has it, like, what's the state of your system now? How long has it taken you to get there? But if not, then, is there like a kind of a combination of, because you're saying you have like containers and then... Yeah, so I, I the, the question was about um, how long my system has been there and if I'm growing my own food forest. And um, the answer is I'm growing as much as I can while we're renting. So I can't establish a permanent system. We'll, fingers crossed, hopefully move this summer, but, um, and I'll, I'll start it. But I have almost everything in containers right now so that when we do buy a place, I can move everything in the ground. So I've got like a hickory that I started from seed, a live oak, a malabar chestnut, a bunch of other trees that I've started that are in pots that are growing now so that I can transplant them when I move. Um, these these uh, principles, like food forest principles, they apply even to like regular vegetable gardening to a certain extent where you just grow food in diverse systems and apply mulch and that sort of thing and it helps. So I'm doing it on a smaller scale in that capacity, but I can't do the permanent system yet. Just so mulch, you said like you can get it for free. So what is it that they sell like at like Home Depot? Like what is that mulch that makes it so? It's the same thing, just with dye and stuff added to it. In a lot of cases, um, some some plants need more specific mulch. Like blueberries need acidic soil, so they should be grown with pine straw mulch because pine needles have a ton of vitamin C that breaks down into citric acid. That's a great question. So food forests work really well in the tropics and the subtropics, but they work equally well in northern climates. You just have to choose a different set of species. So you won't be able to have an avocado tree, you know, or a mango tree uh, in your system, but you could grow apples and pears and a uh, lot of plums, peaches. There are a lot of, uh, you know, instead of growing muscadine grapes, you could grow like true grapes. There are, there are substitute species. You can really fill this out for any system. Um, my parents are just getting started growing one in the desert in Arizona, which is a whole different set of species than this. It just depends on the climate and 
you'll have to do a little bit of research to figure out which which trees fill each of these roles <coughs> in the system. Everybody's ready to go out and start growing food um, at the earliest possible time. And uh, if not, I'll see you guys after spring break. <laughs>